everyone, this is Katie Lacodaro with BWB TV. I'm joined here virtually with Scott Schliebner, Senior Vice President, Center for Rare Diseases at PRA Health Sciences. Thanks so much for joining me today, Scott. Oh, great. My pleasure to be here. Great. So uh, just to start off, I'd love if you would give us just a bit of background on yourself and your role at PRA. Sure, thanks. Yeah, I've been in uh, the clinical research, clinical drug development space for well into my third decade now. Um, uh, PRA Health Sciences is a global clinical research organization, and um, I've been very focused on the development of new medicines for unmet medical needs and specifically for um, patients who suffer from a rare disease. And, uh, you know, my personal passion is, is making sure that patients, wherever they exist, whatever they look like, wherever they may be, um, have access to new therapies. And that's kind of my, my personal mission. Awesome, thank you. Now, what are some of the unique challenges faced by rare disease patients and how do these challenges impact the development of new treatments for rare diseases? Yeah, sure. So in the clinical drug development space, you know, uh, running clinical trials and developing new medicines is very regulated and it takes a long time and it has a lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the case for fairly simple, straightforward diseases. When you overlay rare diseases on top of that complicated process, it becomes exponentially really difficult. And that's because, you know, rare diseases, you know, by definition, there are few and, and, and few numbers of patients and they tend to be geographically spread around. So um, finding where patients are or connecting them with research or investigators or clinical sites is very difficult. Um, also, you know, a lot of rare diseases, um, you know, the majority of them occur in children. And so when you think about um, a clinical trial for a rare disease patient and it's a child, then you're really talking about really an entire family enrolling, parents, caregivers, what happens to siblings. We've even had to do things with families' pets at times to help sort of ensure they can participate. Um, so it ends up becoming really an entire family endeavor. Um, and a lot of times patients and families need to travel really long distances to participate in a study, whether that's a long drive to an academic medical center, or maybe it's a gene therapy study where families literally need to fly from one country to another to participate in a clinical study. So that's very difficult. Um, and then also the diseases themselves are often multidisciplinary and complex, and sometimes we don't understand a lot about them because there hasn't been a lot of research done. So taken together, there's a lot of different complexities that make um, rare diseases very challenging, and running clinical studies and developing new medicines in that space is extra hard, filled with a few hurdles we need to try to work to overcome. Yeah, absolutely. Now, we've seen patient-centric has become a buzzword. Can you provide your view on what being patient-centric means? Sure, yeah, patient-centric, uh, patient-focused, patient-centricity, mm -hmm. that's a term I'm not a super big fan of, but you know, there it, it is becoming a bit of a, a, a trending sort of label and, and term that gets used. Um, I'm really glad that we're seeing some good progress in that space, though. You now see things like uh, regulatory agencies and the FDA really encouraging pa patient-focused drug development um, sort of steps, really encouraging patients to be involved. At the end of the day, clinical research and clinical trials typically hasn't really thought about patients a lot, which is very ironic given that you have to absolutely have patients participate to further along these new medicines. But patients have typically been an afterthought. Clinical studies get developed, um, they get pushed out into the world, and then often we cross our fingers and hope that patients come and enroll. Um, a patient-focused, kind of patient-centric mindset would be, of course, thinking about patients first and keeping them at the center of our plans and designing clinical studies, designing approaches, um, designing assessments and evaluations, thinking about patients first and foremost. So. If we can take that sort of a mindset and think about first first what patients can realistically accommodate, um, what can work with their lives, um, what is feasible for them and their family, and design a study around a patient, then we start getting to being a little bit more patient focused. Um, 
A lot of organizations struggle with this. You know, it's hard to necessarily have a patient involved in every conversation or in planning every step of it. I think we're seeing some good strides, but I think we should all challenge ourselves. If we if we think we're being patient focused, we should kind of raise our hand and say, well, wait, do I have a patient here with me? Have I run that by a patient? Are they really guiding us? And I think we should challenge ourselves to be more and more um, patient focused that way. Definitely. So in your opinion and in your experiences, why is it important for industry, academic researchers, and rare disease patients to all partner and collaborate? Yeah, well, so building upon the challenges that we face in rare disease um, and developing new drugs for rare diseases, um, to overcome those hurdles, we really need to work together. So first and foremost, um, collaborations. Um, so we have industry partners developing new therapies. We have academic researchers who may know a lot about a disease or may be able to run a clinical trial at their site. It's the patients, though, that really understand their own disease often better than anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, they often understand the, the course of their disease. Um, they're usually, of course, more in touch with the day-to-day -day symptoms and challenges they have. And it's important to fold those things into a clinical trial so that we're not just looking at say regulatory endpoints that might help a drug be approved that might be um, um, suggested by regulators we also need to think about what's in it for the patients and our clinical trials really addressing needs that patients are really sort of suffering from every day mm -hmm. um, so to overcome those challenges of geogra geography um, multidisciplinary diseases um, maybe entire families enrolling in studies we really need academic investigators, patients, and industry really to come together to try to work at solving that. Um, there's been some great examples and case studies of that. Um, I wish we saw that as kind of the norm with how things operated, but um, that collaboration is really key in this space. Great. So throughout your career, what are some of the emerging innovations that you've seen positively impact drug development for rare diseases? Yeah, well, um, Clinical research, somebody who's been in clinical research for a long time, we still operate in a pretty archaic manner in that clinical trials are designed and conducted really the same way they have been for several decades. We have not advanced. Um, clinical trials are regulated, but we're also in a very risk averse um, environment where we're sometimes slow to adopt innovations. Meanwhile, when we look to other industries, we see incredible technological advances with our ability to connect via video, um, mobile technology that we have is fantastic. The advances in um, artificial intelligence and machine learning are really moving forward. We've been slow to integrate those into clinical research, but we're starting now to see some good trends. Um, the COVID pandemic has actually been a great accelerant and catalyst for helping encourage more of these changes. So right now um, we're sort of being forced to adopt some technology to get through things um, a little bit as a band-aid to sort of keep clinical trials going through the pandemic. The hope is that, you know, we will learn that we can operate that way and we can be more innovative. And as we come out of this phase, um, we'll, we'll be operating in a more innovative fashion, leveraging technology. So a couple of the things that um, are out there that are really making a really big difference right now are new research paradigms, things like virtual clinical trials or decentralized models that essentially um, make clinical studies, it brings studies directly to patients as opposed to having patients travel long distances to clinical sites. Mm -hmm. It removes the burden from patients and kind of really going back to that patient-centric mindset, it makes studies revolve around patients. And so by using um, a mobile health platform, um, some other technology, we can connect via telehealth to our physicians and save patients and families, you know, many hours traveling. Um, we can use wearable connected devices uh, that are Bluetooth enabled that allow us to collect data from patients in their own home, allow us to collect data really in a continuous fashion. So, um, you know, when a patient goes to a clinical site um, once a month for a year, you get a data point once a month. But when we're able to actually make that more continuous from a patient's home, we understand how um, the drugs affect our, is affecting patients on a real-time basis. So it's a little more realistic. It has good applicability. So there's a lot of advantages there. So between mobile health, telehealth, um, and some wearable devices, 
we can change the way clinical trials are run, move them really to be more patient focused. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that innovation will really help accelerate clinical trials, bring new therapies to patients faster. So there's great trends in that direction. There's a lot more work to do, but um, I think we're seeing some good kind of positive steps. Yeah, that sounds great. And, and hopefully, as you said, some of these technologies and innovations are here to stay. Well, Scott, thank you so much for your time today and the dedication that you've made to the rare disease community. Thanks, Katie. My pleasure being with you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for tuning into this segment of BWB TV, and we will see you next time.